This week, in the Enterprise News segment, Akamai acquires multi-factor authentication specialist Cryptco. HP acquires Bromium to enhance its security platform. Cyber insurance firm Cowbell emerges from stealth with $3.3 million in seed funding and more. In our second segment, we interview Brian Dye, Chief Product Officer at Corelight, a help systems company, to discuss the path to threat hunting is paved with great network data. In our third segment, we interview Tony Meehan, Vice President of Engineering at Endgame. And we're going to talk about how to build an engineering team for every stage of company growth. So stay tuned for all of that and more on this episode of Enterprise Security Weekly. This is Security Weekly, for security professionals, by security professionals. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show where we talk security vendors and aren't afraid to name names. It's Enterprise Security Weekly. Cloud-first development helps your business move fast, but misconfigurations and blind spots are part of the deal. App and dev teams get the flexibility, while security teams are left with the stress of managing new risk using legacy workflows. ExtraHop RevealX provides cloud-native network detection and response, backed by cloud-scale machine learning that helps you spot threats and unify processes across hybrid environments. Learn more at extrahop.com forward slash security weekly. That's extrahop.com forward slash security weekly. Networks are becoming increasingly complex and fragmented, and digital transformation and DevOps are driving an explosion in network connectivity changes. With each new network connection, cyber attackers may gain another opening to breach or traverse the network. At Tufin, they've pioneered a policy-based approach to network security management using automation and analytics. As a result, you can make network changes in minutes instead of days reliably and securely. To learn more about Tufin, the security policy company, go to securityweekly.com forward slash Tufin in and sign up for a free evaluation. By the end of 2020, 99% of exploited vulnerabilities will be publicly disclosed and known to IT system admins. The consequences of that fact means the burglar will already be in your house because you left the front door wide open by failing to patch known vulnerabilities. How can you keep the threat actors out? Through cloud-based automation, Automox enables you to slam the door on unpatched OS and third-party vulnerabilities across your entire Windows, Mac, and Linux infrastructure. Take advantage of a free trial with Automox to not only see the vulnerability status of your infrastructure, but do something about it within minutes. Start automating the fundamentals of cyber hygiene at securityweekly.com forward slash Automox. That's securityweekly.com forward slash Automox. Welcome to episode number 155 of Enterprise Security Weekly for September 25th, 2019. I am your host, Matt Alderman, sitting in for Paul Asadorian, who is at the Compass Cyber Security Symposium today. Joining me for the news segment is Mr. John Strand. John, welcome. Hey, this is like two weeks in a row. This I know. is pretty weird. I know. It's, it, it's really cool when back. you come in for the Enterprise News because we get some really um, unfiltered uh, comments. <laughs> but Matt, we're also getting back into that theme where if I'm on the show, usually Paul's not. <laughs> yes, um, once again, it seems like it's uh, doing it with you a lot, which is pretty cool. But we have somebody else on the show with us. We do. So Jeff is Mann kind of is joining us for both the news and the interview segments. Jeff, welcome. And Jeff has his mute on. He does have his mute on. Sorry about that. I am filling Paul. in for Matt, who's filling in for Paul. <laughs> yeah, right. We just we just rotated today, John. I moved just into the host up. seat. Jeff moves into co-host seat. We're all good. Awesome. We have exciting news about the Security Weekly webcast program. We are now partnered with ISC Squared as an official CPE provider. If you attend any of our webcasts, you'll be receiving one CPE credit per webcast. Register for one of our upcoming webcasts with ExtraHop, which is tomorrow, SaltStack, Preamp, ServiceNow, or Security, or all of them if you're really brave, by going to securityweekly.com forward slash webcasts. If you've missed any of our previously recorded webcasts, you can find them in our on-demand library at securityweekly.com forward slash on-demand. All right, so some interesting news this week. Um, and so let's start with a couple of the 
to me, the more basic ones, right? The, the product announcements. There's a couple acquisitions in here. Uh, one of them I want to dig into a little deeper because it's interesting to see where the market's kind of moving a little bit. So uh, the first article in here is Illumio's latest adaptive security platform releases support for containers. And my response yeah. is about time. Oh, that's I, I well, I wasn't I, I thought that they already supported containers. Maybe the, the release is a little bit behind because I remember talking with them. I can't remember. I think it was a black hat. And I thought that they already had container support. So maybe they had announced it or was, they were talking about a black hat. And now the press release is hitting. But yeah, I thought for, for some reason they already had that. I thought I so too. Wrong. They've been talking a lot about micro segmentation, right? In yeah, the network which, and on the cloud side and some things. So I assume they were already supporting aspects of container micro segmentation. But this article talks about how they're actually now supporting that container micro segmentation uh, capability, not just at the network layer, um, which yeah. I've always been a big believer in anyways from, from the days at Layered Insight is because containers don't necessarily have to hit the TCP IP stack, you had to do micro segmentation at the container layer to bring those concepts in because if it wasn't hitting the network, you couldn't do it there anyways. Yeah. Well, and I, I think... I still come back to one of my main concerns is just how incredibly difficult this problem set is and how you actually have a platform that will actually understand that level of segmentation at the application level. And I also think it's incredibly necessary moving forward with micro segmentation and cloud computing that we start having these conversations like, well, we've got a firewall in between. And like you said, well, honestly, um, that may not be giving you the level of visibility or protection that you actually need to keep these things from hurting each other. Uh, so it's a very complex problem. And I, there's a lot of vendors in this space, but uh, I don't know. Some of the technology is cooler than others, I guess I'll say. But I, I'm confused, John, because I thought the whole move to the cloud was to make security easier. <laughs> right? At the right, right layer. I, I keep talking to people, Jeff, when we're at conferences and we kind of get together and they're like, yeah, cloud, man. I'm like, we lost. We lost everybody. Let, let's just get over it. Uh, we lost the battle. Sauron won. And uh, we're, we're all slaves to the cloud at this point. Um, and Jeff, for, just out of curiosity, I'm seeing a lot of my customers that had very, very solid traditional architectures that were very, very difficult to break into. And now moving into the cloud, it seems like many organizations are willing to make that trade for all the benefits that you get from the cloud, for scalability, ease of deployment, ease of maintenance, uh, tighter integration to DevOps at the expense of security. And most organizations are willing to make that trade. And I wanted to get your opinion on that, too. Yeah, I I, I think I'm seeing the same thing, and, and I would even simplify it to say, I, I think the allure of the cloud is the uh perception that it's cheaper and and you know you don't have to pay for the hardware anymore you just lease it if you will uh mm -hmm. you do all, you know yes there's scalability but you know i deal with i i wasn't wasn't long before i brought up pci but you know when you think of retailers and merchants you, you don't put uh cash registers in the cloud you might have some of the back end infrastructure in the cloud, but you know you still have brick and mortar and you know by the thousands. Um, and so there there's there's a certain limitation to what you can do with the cloud in certain organizations, if you will. But most of the customers that I've talked to that are that have made some sort of move, it if you read between the lines, it's because it's cheaper. And Unfortunately, uh, security is is too often not even thought of or not even a consideration other than I think there's a perception that uh, if I put stuff in the cloud, somebody else is doing the security for me. It's taken care of, which I think is uh, a, a, a gross misconception. It's misguided. Uh, we actually did a s uh, segment last week on this show about what do I need? What products do I need when I move to the cloud? And, and the reason right. for this conversation is because where are you? Way, where are that, you? Yeah. That was fantastic. Oh, by thank the way. you. I thanks. Oh, you watched great. it. Oh, nice. Because you, you had to drop off. So thanks. But, <laughs> but, the, but security shifts, the layer shift, right? You have to move higher into the stack because the infrastructure stack is being abstracted away. So those traditional things we did at the network and the endpoint are a lot harder in the cloud when the cloud providers manage those. And, and why containerization and container security and bringing things like micro segmentation at the container layer is important because 
you can't do it at the network layer easily in the cloud. And so these are the things that we're going to see these continue shifts in for that. And, and so if you're applying traditional security at the lower levels of the stack, you're going to have a hard time transitioning to the cloud because you really need to move your security products up the stack into the application layer and, and around containers and some other things. So that's why we well, see how, these moves. How much is it uh, moving your security uh, technologies and tools, and how much of it is you need a different type of security technology it, or tool? Well, it, it, it's a lot of different stuff. Yeah, that's that's the that's the key, and I think that's what Matt really hit very well last week. And mm -hmm. I also think that there's this issue of trust, and it's exchanging traditional problems that we're aware of for brand new problems that we don't really mm -hmm. know how to find. Um, like we've got a whole bunch of Google calendar issues that we're going to be talking about at Wild West Hacking Fest that are not traditional security issues, but organizations tend not to think about them. And this kind of leads into some of the other stories like Akamai with multi-factor multi authentication and uh, one login. And then some of the, uh, some of the uh, vendors that we're going to talk about later on and some of the news stories are trying some different approaches to security from all the way from like passwords to how you handle that multi-factor authentication as well. So I, I think it's definitely a trade, right? Like you're trading an existing security set of problems that we've spent years developing compliance documentation for, for an entirely new set. And sometimes that ignorance doesn't necessarily mean that that movement to the cloud is necessarily more or less secure. Yeah, and, and to your point, John, you're trading the firewall for a better identity access management system. You're trading the endpoint for the application because that's where the kind of the frontier that's where the perimeter is moving and so what we're used to using at at the firewall network perimeter layer and at the endpoint are really shifting into identity and application type of solutions and it's so it's different and and you're going to see as we see in some of these announcements we're going to see more enhancements on the identity application side of the house because that's where that's where the attacks are going to shift absolutely yeah so let's talk one login launches new behavioral risk assessment platform. We've seen other announcements like this where people are trying to understand the behavior of the user to determine how should I allow them to authenticate? Should I ask for additional things like multi-factor or, or other um, uh, aspects for, for, for login? Um, th this seems to be a little catch up to me a bit because we've seen a lot of uh, vendors moving in this direction. Where do you think one login is, John, in, in this transformation? I, so one of the things that sucks about this is how do you actually describe what's happening here? Um, everyone's talking about getting rid of passwords and things like that. I, I don't think passwords are going to go away anytime really soon. But um, the thing that I think is interesting whenever we're talking about behavioral risk assessment, whenever a, a user is interacting with an object, right, is it's not just authentication, but it's kind of a continuous authentication. And it is part of that user behavioral and entity analytics stack that you're going to look at. But I like the idea of it actually being tied in as part of authentication. John Strand sits down at his computer. He usually checks his email, maybe accesses four or five files. He's working on those four or five files for the course of the day, closes it out, he goes home. Whereas John Strand sits down at his computer system and is now accessing 400 files in the space of five seconds. If we can kind of tie that continuous authentication with that behavioral risk assessment, I think that this is a cool move uh, whenever we're talking about implementing uh, those types of security controls, going closer to the application, going closer to the objects that the subjects are actually interacting with. Um, the thing that bothers me is in many of our tests, we haven't seen these actually be that effective at all mm -hmm. at detecting um, a lot of the attacks that we leverage at them. And I think that that's just a maturity. Uh, but I do like the idea that they're at least thinking fundamentally different about access to cloud applications and what you're going to authenticate to and how you're going to authenticate to it, because there is a desperate need for at least some type of new solution. Yeah. And is it because from a pen test perspective, you're not like at machine speed because you're you're still doing this manual and you can make it kind of look normal? Or is it just they don't really understand the nuances of what behavior looks like during a pen test and not during a pen test? Well, I think that it's two problems, and this is a this is a conversation I've had with Jeff in the past. Is are, are security vendors good at detecting actual threat actors, or are they just good at detecting pen testers and vulnerability assessments? I think that that's yeah. a conversation that's much longer than the show can get into. But it's absolutely gets into the data set that you're using to train your artificial intelligence, that you're using to actually build your applications, 
has got to somehow map to what you're going to see in the real world. Unfortunately, many companies, not all of them, have absolutely no bearing or understanding what real attacks actually look like, and their products suffer because of it. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. I, I mean, I, I had a more fundamental problem with this article. One is like they don't really go into a lot of detail of what they're doing, uh, other than you the know, term AI. Yeah, you know, <laughs> sprinkling a little little terminology in, but. Uh, sort of dovetailing off of what John was saying, but more from a, a user perspective, you know, it, it looks like the success of this product uh, is also hin hinging on users uh, always having predictable behavior and, and not doing things out of the ordinary, mm -hmm. which is which, which is what hackers and pen testers try to take advantage of, yes. But I, I would be pissed if I was a regular user that tried to do something slightly different and was blocked. Uh, you know, so I don't know if you call it a false positive in this sense, but uh, false, it's called a false negative, actually. A false negative. Uh, but you know, from I see it being problematic in, in, in terms of actually using it in terms of how, I guess, how mature it is in terms of I want to do what I want to do as a user. And, and uh, yeah, it's a long conversation. Yeah, like Chad, so. yeah I, I agree. Um, but we've seen a lot of announcements in this in this direction. So the question is, are these things effective in helping us better provide access and authentication into a system or not. And if they're not, then the question becomes, where's the next evolution in identity, which I've been asking that question for a few years now, because I haven't quite seen that next, like what, what is that next kind of major leap in the identity space that actually helps us do a better job of identity and access versus some of these little things that sound cool, but do they, if they don't work, then they're not really moving the needle. But the part of the problem is, and I was I was holding this up before the show, but I'm sure John is familiar with this seminal work. Yeah, um, absolutely. You know the the whole concept is, you know, whatever rule, even and I think this probably extends into AI because it's not that I yet. Um, you know, whatever rules, whatever thresholds you come up with, you can you can fly under the radar. You can circumvent them. You can you can modify your behavior to be within the bounds of normal, and and still make a lot of progress in terms of doing something as a bad guy. You know, in the early days when that paper was written, you know, it it, it was all it was more about network level attacks, and and it was basically how to how to defeat early intrusion detection systems, which is basically throttle back. You know, slow down your scans, slow down your port scans, and things like that to something that fits within the realm of normal. I have to think that even though we're talking new and different, the same principle applies. There's some measure that's normal, and you can fly under the radar still. Yep. Uh, Akamai acquires multi factor authentication specialist Cryptco. Uh, this oh, one's interesting. Never What's that? I've never a crypt code. Before. No, I hadn't either, but I saw the announcement uh, pop up the other day, and it looks like what they're going to do is add this multi factor authentication into their enterprise application access to provide zero trust. There's another uh, buzzword. Um, and if we think about Akamai from uh, a WAF and, and some of the stuff they've done on the web, web app front, this, this seems kind of right in that they're trying to provide an additional layer of security into those. Uh, enterprise applications, which sounds good. I don't know how easy it is to use. I don't know how cumbersome this is. It sounds right. Well, I think we'll have to see how it gets integrated. Yeah, I, I don't know. Yeah, because remember, they're they're not buying this for the product itself. They're buying this to integrate it with their existing product stack. And I don't see exactly where it's going to go in. So it's hard to say. It, it's like Jeff mentioned one of the previous news or news stories. There's not a lot here uh, mm -hmm. for us to actually sink our teeth into. There are things where it's like resistant to phishing, but still simple to use with no need for pin codes. And that scares the living hell out of me because almost every single uh, two-factor authentication or multi-factor authentication platform we've, we've encountered has had a myriad of different issues associated with it. Um, so I don't know what that means. It's a two-factor, but there's no pin and it's easy to use and it's secure. That's that's going to be interesting uh, to see how that actually plays out. But we have to wait and see because there's not enough data in here yet to make a determination one way or the other. Right. 
Yeah, I mean, the article is basically a paragraph. My my first thought was people that we know that used to work at Akamai that went to work for MFA companies that got acquired. It, it almost seems like Akamai is trying to play catch up with somebody. Yeah, we're trying to pull I, their employees back. Well, we used to, <laughs> we saw this at EMC all the time when I was at RSA. You'd have an EMC um, solution. You see a bunch of guys leave, create a startup, and then EMC would just buy them back. So it, maybe it's the same thing. I don't know. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Um, I want to talk the HP acquisition of Bromium. Um, I like, I like how they call Bromium a startup company. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, what um, I, so there's a couple if things they've that, never heard of it. It's a startup company. Right. <laughs> Whoever wrote the article. That's true. But Bromium has been around for a while, as we all know. Uh, what I think is interesting is a couple things. Number one, there is no disclosure on what they paid, and there is no discussion about who's coming over. Um, and so I went out and I pulled another article from Fortune because I wanted to understand, I was trying to find the acquisition price, right? You see an acquisition, you want to know, was it a good acquisition? Wasn't it, wasn't a, a good acquisition. And, uh, this one is, is interesting when you dig into the fortune article, it, it says HP has not said whether any Bromium employees will be joining the company, implying the deal may just be a tech grab. Now, Bromium had a strategic relationship with HP, and HP sure. has been using this product for a couple years as part of some of their other offerings. Uh, it looks like they decided to buy it, maybe because Bromium couldn't survive anymore, and they didn't want to have to give up um, that integration uh, to make it work. So this could just be a tech grab. Um, and it, it, it continues to say Bromium struggle are an indicative, uh, indicative of shifting fortunes on the cybersecurity market, especially in the endpoint market. Um, and it gets into, you know, with a very successful IPO in CrowdStrike, you know, what happens to all the other 80 plus endpoint protection vendors that are out there because, you know, Silence got bought, CrowdStrike goes public. Carbon Black goes public, then gets acquired. So then what does that mean for the rest of the endpoint market? And this, this is what I think is going to happen, is we're going to see this consolidation. And the question is, who gets consolidated quickly, and then who just eventually just vanishes in the market? Well, I, I, you know, I used to say, I, I think it's better now, but we used to say it's like every week there was like 100 new endpoint security vendors that were entering the market. It was getting out of hand. Um, I can speak firsthand, Bromium was solid, a uh, very, very solid platform from a security perspective, but it had the issue of being overbalanced to security and the functionality was somewhat limited. And, you know, that, that was the biggest problem that we saw with our customers. They would implement Bromium, the security was amazing, and then all of a sudden the employees and the executives would say, rip this crap out of our environment now because I can't do the things that I normally want to do. Now, it looks like with HP, and the uh, and the SureClick um, uh, the SureClick uh, program, it looks as though they were licensing Bromium for that, and they were using it as part of that platform. And maybe, just maybe, HP found a way to actually make this technology more acceptable to organizations. And maybe, just maybe, the cost of licensing versus the cost of buying it was just better in the long run for HP to actually buy the company outright. But yeah, you're right. I don't know what's going to happen to the people that are working at Bromium. We have no idea. Was this a tech grab? Who knows? But the concern that I have is if Bromium's going down the path of just selling off to somebody like HP, there's going to be a whole lot of other endpoint security vendors that are going to be in a much worse position than Bromium was in the next uh, the next 18 months. Yeah, in the, in the article, this Fortune article that talks about this acquisition talks about Tanium. Cyberies and, and Sentinel One is the next big three. What happens to them? And that'll be interesting to see how that market continues to play out. Yeah. Yeah, I'm curious. Uh, in the old days, and sorry, I keep bringing up the old days, but uh, it, it almost reminds me a little bit of back in the day when, you know, was it McAfee first uh, got put on all the Microsoft PCs that were going out the door and sort of cornering the market in that sense? I, I, I just wonder if there's some sort of... Uh, modern day parallel you know because is bromium going to be still publicly available for anything or only available on hp products and i'm also curious whether they're going to figure out a way to put it on their printers or if it's just on their pcs <laughs> uh, I, I would say just looking at the way hp tends to do things uh bromium will get rolled up into the rest of the hp's product line 
I can't yep. see HP just allowing it to exist on its own. As you know, yep. HP is like Cisco. Once you roll it into Cisco, they want to rebrand, they want to rename, they want to bring yep. it in as the entire product line. So I think that's most likely what's going to happen. Here. And I think the good news for Bromium here is by having the strategic relationship with HP, it gave them an opportunity for an exit where now you have to look at Again, the other 80 plus endpoint vendors, where are their strategic relationships? Do you see some roll ups? Because if you don't have those relationships in place, it can get pretty difficult uh, to find an exit path potentially. Well, and, and there's not a lot of boats, right? Mm. If you're looking at who's getting acquired, who's getting purchased or going IPO, your, your two paths are basically get purchased, go IPO. And IPO is way hard uh, to actually do and be successful. And if you're looking at getting purchased, there's only so many buyers on the market. Exactly right. So, John, your comment begs the question, if if HP is ultimately going to sort of uh, uh, absorb Bromium into its product line, what happens to existing Bromium customers? I have no idea, but I think you still have your contract, right? I mean, if Bromium had existing contracts and HP purchased them, then the then language of that contract would be the contracts that exist would be honored or that you'd have to be bought out. Um mm-hmm to the completion of those contracts. And I don't know if Bromium has long-term five-year contracts. I can't imagine they have many that are beyond three. But I think that that question is a really important one because if you're a Bromium customer, a happy Bromium customer, uh, your life's going to change dramatically <laughs> in the very near future. Yeah. Yes, you may, maybe you're not a happy Bromium yeah. customer. You may not <laughs> you mean I have to buy HP notebook computers from here on out? Oh, crap, right. that's a worst-case scenario. Because <laughs> yeah, right. no, one, no one wants to use HP notebook computers. Yeah. <laughs> a couple of funding announcements. The first one, cyber insurance firm Cowbell emerges from stealth with $3.3 million in seed. Now, I know Jack uh, Kudel, who who started this company. Uh, he's from Pleasanton. That's where Layered Insight was um, headquartered. And so Jack was, was a good friend. We had a lot of conversations with Jack. What's interesting about this announcement, it's not necessarily a cybersecurity product per se. He's building a platform to actually help the security brokers um, kind of track and manage cyber insurance policies, right? In in mm. we've seen some evolution in the cyber insurance space um, a bit. And where I think this is positioning itself is how do you know what to verify from an applicant to make sure I can price mm. Uh, policies for cyber insurance and then protect potentially protect the insurance company from payouts that's where i see him kind of positioning this platform which is interesting because i think with the all the ransomware attacks we've seen at certain municipalities where we've seen some payouts and not payouts the question for the cyber insurers is how do i price policies going forward if i'm going to start paying out a bunch of ransoms um you know, so, uh, oh go ahead oh uh, uh, i was just going to say this is awesome uh, so I like the business model, the idea of a company that's actually working through setting up assessments specifically in line to reduce the costs and make your company uh, more of an insurable company. And I also think that their their business plan is great because I can totally see insurance companies coming to Cyber Cowbell and saying, hey, we would like to partner with you whenever we write an insurance policy for a customer. We'd like to make sure that there's some kind of due diligence being done. Uh, on the basis of those companies to actually make sure that they aren't just buying insurance and doing crap security. The the big issue with these types of platforms is what are the data points that they're actually hooking into and do those data points actually tie to reality at all? Um, are you going to look at the configuration of their SMTP server and make a determination, oh, well, this is a secure company or not a secure company? It generally requires a lot more uh, of an assessment than just a handful of different data points. So that would say, the, the, would say the dirty letters, John. Say the yeah. dirty letters. <laughs> PCI? <laughs> There you go. <laughs> Any assessment, PCI being Jeff's yep. um, control set of, of the century. So, Yeah. So, so I think that this is cool, um, but it also gets into a larger question of security and insurance mm-hmm. and what's going to happen if you're looking at like Mondelez. Our insurance company is going to look for ways where they actively don't pay, even though anybody that's working in this space knows insurance companies pay out over 95% of the time on insurance liability uh, that they're responsible for covering. So they seem to be doing pretty good, but after a while, they're going to get sick and tired of paying out to companies that have done nothing to secure their environments. And that's when they start to change. I agree with you. And I think that's the shift that's going to come from the cyber insurers is they're going to do a lot more due diligence and you need a way to figure out how to make that scale or premiums are going to go through the roof one or the other. 
-hmm. Well, and that's kind of what I was going to touch on too, was, uh, I've, I've been dealing with breached companies, uh, for let's round up and say 15 years and, and back sort of in the earlier days or even dealing with companies that were in fear of a breach. Um, you know, the, the conventional wisdom back then for many companies was I want to be as secure as everybody else in my space, no more, no less. But if I'm doing mm -hmm. as much or in most cases, as little as everybody else, then nobody's going to fault me as a company for not doing best practices or due diligence. And then we shifted into kind of a, what are best practices? Now, to use PCI as an example, because I've dealt with a lot of merchant breaches um, over the years, uh, you know, the conventional wisdom was, and what everybody likes to talk about is no company was ever PCI compliant at the time of a breach, which is a different discussion. But uh, at what I've tried to tell a lot of companies over the year, past couple of years, because the idea of cyber cyber security insurance has been around for, gosh, I don't know, six, eight years now. Um, you know, everybody's trying to jump on the bandwagon. Well, I can't afford the breach. I can't afford to do all the stuff that complying with any standard, whether it's PCI, requires, it's too costly, it's too expensive, plus the cost of assessing and auditing, why don't I just buy an insurance policy and be done with it? And I think that's the way the early in cyber insurance uh, companies were basically selling their product. Uh, I like the idea here, uh, as John was saying, of they've, they've sort of hit the nail on the head in trying to identify the problem, you know, what's the what's the right measurement for whether a company should be insured or what they should have to pay for insurance you know it's a little bit easier to look at a person and say you're fat you're going to pay more for a premium you smoke you know you're you know whatever those things are or you know flip it around you're healthy and you get a discount um i don't see anything any other way of doing this than applying whatever is the applicable regulatory compliance standard that the the said company falls under under within whatever their industry or vertical is and the warning i've given to my customers over the years is if you think it was bad going through a qsa assessment wait till you get an insurance underwriter or worse an insurance claims adjuster coming uh to, you know to see how well you're doing the things you're supposed to be doing so just a word of caution i like the idea that they're coming up with measurement i don't see how they do it really yet yeah, I, yeah, it's it, and, it's tough. I we've seen I've seen some other solutions attempt to do this with the data that they have, but it's it's a snapshot. The application is a point in time on controls. How do you know that those controls are still in place six months after the policy is written? So, which means some sort of continuous monitoring or something of some sort. So it looks like the main factors that they focus in on. I'm seeing they got their cowbell factors. Um, network security, cloud security, endpoint, dark intelligence, which we can just safely ignore that. Uh, funds transfer, cyber extortion, compliance, and insider threats. I don't know what technical controls they're actually hooking into to make assessments on that. I'm going through like and zooming in on every single one of their pictures of their dashboards and the things that they want us to see. <laughs> right. But I'm not right. seeing a lot of what those te how those technical controls are actually fed up. Well, maybe and what I can do, John, is get Jack on for a segment and kind of walk us through it because I'd be interested to know. Yeah. Well, and I, and I think it's an important thing. Like, you know, <laughs> just, Jeff said, you think PCI assessments, QSA was bad. Oh, just wait for insurance companies over the next five years. Because um, I got to be honest, a lot of pen testing companies are talking to insurance companies, and uh, that's going to be an, an unholy union of two forces in security that I don't think anybody is going to want to deal with. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, one last story I wanted to cover quickly is source code security firm Psycode launches with 4.6 oh. million in funding. Now, I, I got to read this statement because I think this is um, an interesting claim. Psycode claims it has no competitors, as no other company oh. provides solutions capable of protecting source code from every angle. Uh, company believes you can't fully protect source code with existing solutions such as source code management, CASB, or DLP. Um, CASB and DLP don't make any sense to me in that statement, by the way, but we do see source code analysis tools. We do see other source code types of technologies out there. I don't know how Psycode's doing it, but we know that the security supply chain is going to be one of those next attack vectors. I think it's good that we have more solutions out there. I'm just not sure they're in a category all by themselves yet. Well, but this whole thing where they hook into like GitHub and Bitbucket and, uh, 
team foundation server and like, okay, so how the hell are they doing DLP on that? Like, I, I don't know. I mean, it sounds interesting. I mean, the idea of being able to point, um, be, the idea of being able to actually point like source code management, security analysis at like a GitHub repository and have it automatically trigger and do source code analysis anytime there's a new commit on any of the different branches and generate a report. That stuff sounds awesome. But whenever they started throwing in CASB, what the hell? Like, how did CASB and DLP come into this? That's what that's I'm saying. Where I got lost. Yeah, I, I, I mean, we've got good solutions like Veracode and, and Fortify out there doing source code analysis. We have other people pulling down binaries and libraries for container and, and analyzing those. Um, so, yeah, I didn't, I didn't understand the CASB DLP piece in this article, but yeah, source code in the in the entire supply chain needs to be secured. There are solutions out there that are doing pieces of it that get integrated into a CI CD pipeline from a continuous integration, yeah. continuous deployment perspective. So this this concept that they don't have any competition befuddles me a little bit. Um, it's a great marketing claim, but at the end of the day, there's people doing pieces of this somewhere. Well, and also the people that are doing this, like you mentioned Veracode, they're fairly large companies with a fairly robust track record and have been doing it for a long, long time. I, like I said, I'm always skeptical. You know, you're always hopeful that somebody comes over and kicks over the status quo and creates something new. And I hope that that's what this is too. But honestly, this is not something that you just simply walk into with $4.6 million and all of a sudden you've solved this entire problem end to end. Uh, that, that, that claim is garbage. And I, and I know that we get worked up over, you know, super exciting claims by vendors. But sometimes we do have to tell people to pump the brakes a little bit and, you know, kind of be more clear about what it is that you're doing. Just so you know, the run rate on $4.6 million of seed money uh, doesn't go very far. <laughs> oh, I know. I know that. I know that all too well. <laughs> so, well. so John, you're you're so young and idealistic. Uh, I, I oh, pretty really? much automatically don't get excited about all these types of claims. You know, reading through the article, it's when I hear secure, I immediately think, okay, they're doing some sort of encryption. I don't see any m mention of any kind of encryption. It's all about identity access management, alerting if there's weird touches of the data. That to me is not secure. Uh, but call me silly and old fashioned. I, but, uh, but, you know, it looks to me like it's more like protecting the source code and who has access to the source code and who, when are people accessing the source code. Um, and it's more source code control detection and response. Right. But it doesn't, it doesn't prevent bad access is it just detects if it happens. Yeah. Which is interesting in and of itself. But I think you'd agree with me that it, <laughs> if you have 150 developers and they're all working in GitHub, you're going to be seeing access constantly you're going to be seeing pull requests you're going to be seeing local copies being shoved all over the place. How, how the hell light bulb moment they're, they're using ai obviously <laughs> oh well shit there we go it seems like everybody <laughs> behaviors it. it's all behavior driven yes. yeah but it, it's like okay so if somebody doesn't get pulled they pull down a full source code repository down to their local system how are you actually protecting that in short we have a lot of questions and these questions <laughs> yes. and answers and yes. you don't have a lot of money to like Yes. Probably do it really point. quickly. Anyways, it's just interesting. Gentlemen, thank you very much. We're going to take a quick break and then welcome Brian Dye from Corelight. 